Hey guys, thank you for joining me. We are still reading the Great Airport Mystery and we are on chapter 12. And it just dawned on me that I haven't been telling you what the name of the chapter is. Usually I say what, what it is, but I don't think I've been telling y'all. So this one is called The Cave Clue. The Hardy Boys wasted no time. Moments later, they were dashing up the circular stairs to the Bayport Control Tower. Is Lou Diamond here? Frank asked as they burst into the room. No, answered a lean, middle-aged man who was seated at a desk. The chief does not come on duty for another hour yet. The brothers explained the situation to him and requested his help. I remember the stand wide plane taking off, the tower man recalled. It departed soon after I came on duty. He quickly checked through his listing of aircraft movements. Here it is, he said, pointing out a small card. The plane took off shortly after midnight. Did the pilot file a flight plan? Frank questioned. Yes, an instrument flight plan to a field in California, the operator responded. I can't tell you exactly because normally we don't keep a record of flight plans here in the tower. He picked up the telephone and snapped the toggle switch mounted on the desk. I'll check with our communication station. It was several minutes before the operator received the information he requested. Then he placed the phone down and turned to the young sleuths. The stand-wide pilot canceled his flight plans at Chicago, he said. After taking on fuel, he departed without filing a new flight plan. Frank and Joe were dismayed. After thanking the tower man for his help, they left hurriedly. I want to call Mr. Allen right away and let him know what happened, Frank said. Mr. Allen's voice was heavy with sleep as he answered the phone. When he heard the news, however, he snapped awake. What? he exclaimed. Peterson didn't have the authority to leave before the scheduled time. Meet me at the stand wide hangar. I'll be right over. The boys next called their father and informed him of the incident. Then they started walking towards the stand wide hangar. Peterson and Lieber decided to vanish and keep everything for themselves, Frank said. That was a valuable load they were carrying. It could make them rich. Peterson might also be trying to escape Clint Hill's ghost, Joe added. Mr. Allen arrived at the hangar and was aghast at the situation. He immediately placed a long-distance call to the Sun Platte Tool Company in California, which was supposed to receive the air shipment. An official there told him the cargo plane had not arrived at the nearby airport. He assured Mr. Allen he would notify him the instant any information concerning the flight was received. Turning from the telephone, Mr. Allen said to the Hardys, I don't mind telling you I'm pretty worried about this whole thing. The boys followed him to Peterson's office, which they thoroughly searched. In the top desk drawer, Frank discovered a notation stating that Mr. Allen had ordered an earlier departure. I never gave such an order. The executive declared. The young sleuths noted that the notation was typed, making it difficult to identify the, the writer. They next went to Mr. Allen to interrogate the night watchman. They went with Mr. Allen to ter interrogate the night watchman, who said Peterson had told him nothing. I thought it was a funny time for him to be taken off, but it's not up to me to question the actions of our company's chief pilot. No, of course not, said Mr. Allen. Using a master key, he searched Lieber's locker, but found no clues. Frank suggested they check the bills of lighting for the Sun Platte shipment. They scrutinized the record for more than an hour, but the results gave no hint of any tampering. Well, Frank said, in sighing, there's nothing more we can do here. After assuring Mr. Allen they would continue tracking every possible lead locally, the Hardys returned to Randy. Sorry, our flight has been grounded, Joe said wryly. Too bad. Well, I'll just return the plane, the pilot replied philosophically. 
I'll be around if you fellas need me again. Maybe next time we'll have better luck. The boys, feeling somewhat let down, drove off. Frank suggested they go to the camera shop and examine the photographs Mr. Freeman was keeping for them. It's a long shot, he said, but maybe those pictures will tell us something. The boys arrived just as Mr. Freeman was opening his shop. He went to the wall safe, opened it, and handed them the negatives and the prints. Joe picked up a magnifying glass from the counter. Mr. Freeman handed Frank another. Meticulously, the Hardy studied each of the aerial photographs. Several minutes passed before Joe suddenly cried out, Look at this! Frank took the print and peered at it through his glass. Joe pointed to the rectangular pasture over which they had flown low before the engine of the aircraft had failed. What do you see in the pasture area? Frank moved his magnifying glass slowly for a better focus. I don't notice anything special, he announced. Unless you mean those three parallel lines running through the center of the pasture. They appear to be ruts or grooves. Exactly, Joe said. What are they? The lines could have been made by a three-wheeled farm tractor, Frank answered, or maybe a small plane, Joe suggested. I wonder, said Frank, and then added, Randy Watson told us the pasture was too short for any airplane to operate out of. I know that's what has me baffled. Mr. Freeman, who had been watching the boys with interest, began glancing at some of the photographs. He asked in what locality the pictures had been taken. When the Hardys told him, his face broke into a wide smile. I thought I recognized the area, he remarked. When I was a boy, splunk splunking was one of my favorite pastimes. I used to go there a lot. Splunking? Frank asked curiously. You mean you went exploring caves in the, that area? Oh, yes, Mr. Freeman answered, obviously pleased in, at recollecting some of his childhood activities. There are several fine caves to be found in those hills. However, it's been so many years since I was there, I wouldn't be able to locate any of them now. How large are these caves? Frank asked with increasing interest. The ones I explored were rather small, the shop owner explained. I promised my parents I wouldn't tackle anything too deep. So I can't say just how large the bigger caves are. The boys thanked Mr. Freeman for his help and then started for home. Both were excited to learn of the caves being in the area where they had seen Bush Barney. Perhaps they speculated the thieves were using the cave to hide their loot. Perhaps, they speculated, the thieves were using the cave to hide their loot. There might have even been one near the pasture we flew over, Joe exclaimed. And if I'm right about the deep grooves having been made by the wheels of a small plane, maybe it's possible the pasture is being utilized as a makeshift runway after all. I have an idea, said Frank. Why don't we rent a helicopter and get a really close look at that area. But first, let's go home and tell the folks about our change of plans. Mrs. Hardy was elated to see her sons and to learn that their plane trip had been canceled. Aunt Gertrude, Aunt Gertrude wore a self-satisfied grin. Good thing, she said. Now you boys will have time for a lunch that will make up for the breakfast you raced through this morning. The Hardy family sat down to a meal of delicious homemade soup, followed by hamburgers, then gingerbread topped with applesauce and whipped cream. While they were eating, Frank and Joe related their conversation with Mr. Freeman and told of their theory concerning the cave hideout. Mr. Hardy was interested at once. A cave would be a perf would be perfect for storing stolen merchandise, he agreed. Incidentally, I've learned that tract of land is part of an abandoned farm, but the whereabouts of the owner is unknown. The boys discussed their plan to explore the area by helicopter. 
Their father approved and suggested that they ask Randy Watson to make arrangements for hiring a craft and pilot. Frank was about to make the call when the telephone rang. He picked it up. An eerie voice at the other end said, Is this the Hardy's house? Hi, Chet, Frank said with a chuckle. His friend was imitating Clint Hill's voice, but as unearthly but as the unearthly voice continued, Frank realized it was not Chet's. The words it spoke turned his blood cold. This is not Chet, intoned the speaker. This is the ghost of Clint Hill. Where is Lance Peterson? And that's the end. I started to read on to the next chapter, but that is the end of chapter 12. Join me next time for chapter 13. It's really starting to get interesting now, right? <laughs>